Parshas Tisetze has 110 verses and 74 mitzvos, the most mitzvos of any parsha, and they really follow each other in rapid succession and rapid fire. Some topics covered in our parsha, they occupy literally an entire book of Talmud. You will have one short paragraph, a few verses in our parsha, and you have an entire book of Talmud, something that you could reasonably take a year to study in depth. And of course, we're going to try to cover the entire parsha in about an hour. The parsha begins with a very unusual mitzvah, when you will go out to the war against your enemies, and Hashem God will deliver them into your hands, and you will capture captives, and you'll see amongst the captives a woman who is very beautiful. You will desire her. You may take her for yourself as a wife. A very unusual mitzvah that you capture a bunch of enemy captives, and amongst the captives you find a really beautiful woman. You want to marry her? You're allowed to marry her under certain conditions. First, you bring her to your house. You shave her head. You let her nails grow. She takes off the garments of her captivity. She cries and mourns her parents for a month. And after that, you can marry her. She could become your wife. You convert her. She becomes Jewish. And she could be your wife. So a very interesting mitzvah. And Rashi tells us that the reason why the Almighty gave us this mitzvah, this loophole, that you could just take a captive non-Jewish woman and just marry her, why would the Torah allow that? And Rashi says a very interesting idea, a very intriguing idea, that the Torah, the objective of the Torah, is to be a contra for the Yetzirah of the evil inclination. And all of Torah is there to oppose the evil inclination, but here, the evil inclination is going to be so strong, your desire to marry this woman is so strong, there's really no way to combat it, and therefore, if the Almighty did not permit it, you would do it anyhow. And therefore, because you would do it anyhow, the Almighty says, okay, I will permit it. It's a very unusual idea that really it should be prohibited, but because there's no way to overcome it in times of war, in the chaos that surrounds the war, you really can't overcome your lusts, your inclinations, and therefore the mind says, I'm going to permit it. So there's a general idea here that the hates or the inclination, it's been compared to a spring. You want to push the spring just a little bit, but if you push it too hard, its backlash will cause even greater Damage. Similarly, over here, we find this, this concept that in this particular scenario in war, you find a beautiful woman, the Eight Sahara, the inclination is so strong, if you reject it, if you resist it, you're not going to be successful, and therefore the mind says, I'm going to permit it. But on the flip side, there's another point here that only over here, only in this particular scenario and situation, you can't control yourself, and the Eight is guaranteed to win, and therefore the Almighty says, capitulate, it's okay. But every other place where the Almighty gives us challenges and there's prohibitions, we know for sure that we can withstand, we can develop the fortitude to overcome. Now, it's been pointed out, last week we read about the whittling down of the soldiers for war. You have all the people that got recently married, all the people who built a house or planted a vineyard, and all the people that have any sins with them, they could all go back home, they don't participate in a war. So who remains? Just the most righteous of people. Yet even the most righteous of people, our sages tell us that once they go out of their environment, once they go to hostile territory, they're in war, the fog of war affects them also spiritually, and they can become lustful of the beautiful captives. My grandfather, bless his memory, he spent the war years from 1938 to 1946 in Sweden, and he said that Sweden was essentially a war, even though it was neutral during the war, but it was a war, a spiritual war, because yeshiva students that would go there, they would enter Sweden as God-fearing, pious, and righteous yeshiva students, and within a month, they would right away succumb to the secular world that was so prevalent there, and they would uh, drop their religion. And that's the idea, that when you're in a compromising situation spiritually, those external conditions really are liable to affect you, and it's likely to influence you negatively. So what is done with this woman? Her head is shaved, her seductive clothes are removed, the nails are allowed to grow, and she has to cry over her parents for a month. So the commentaries talk about uh, various different reasons why this would happen. Either so that his lust for her will dissipate, cooler heads may prevail, and he can move on from his infatuation with her, he'll reconsider, and he won't marry her. You know, he sees her 
in all her glory amongst the rest of the captives, and he desires her. But once she moves into his house, and he, you know, her, she doesn't have the beautiful hair, and she's not wearing the lustful clothings, and she's just crying and complaining, then he'll say, you know what, I don't really want her, and he'll drop this idea. That's what Rashi says. The Ramban introduces another concept, that this is about her mourning. She's going to be converted to Judaism, and she has to mourn her deceased family and her departed faith. And the Torah allows her to mourn over her departed past so that when she unites with her now Jewish husband, her sadness will have been addressed and she can move on and live a somewhat of a normal life going on forward. And the Ramban adds, suppose she's not wrestling with her new faith and she's not wrestling with the fact that she's departing her family, then indeed she can marry him right away. It's only when she is really struggling with this new situation into which she was thrust, only then do you have to go through this uh, month-long process. Now, what happens if he does that, if he marries her? But it shall be that if you do not desire her, then you will send her on her own, but you may not sell her for money. She, you can ens- enslave her because you afflicted her. Rashi here tells us that if you don't desire her, it's going to happen invariably. Why? Because you will hate her. Even though your initial infatuation was so intense, the lust eventually dissipates and it cannot be the basis for an enduring relationship. So that's the first mitzvah that is covered in the Suits Parsha. The next mitzvah is what happens when a man has two wives, one of them that he loves and one of them that he cannot stand, and both of them give him children. But the one that he can't stand, his hated wife, is the one that has the firstborn son, the firstborn son that is rightfully the owner of his birthright, he gets double the inheritance of all the subsequent children. So the Torah tells us that he cannot alter the firstborn right. He can't give it to the son from his beloved wife because it's the firstborn son that gets the double inheritance. The Ramban adds that even if he tried to do it, it would have no halachic validity, meaning that if he tried to alter the way the Torah views the the bequeathing of inheritance to the children, it wouldn't work, but nonetheless, he would transgress this prohibition. Now, Rashi explains the juxtaposition. If you marry the captive woman, yes, maybe you're entitled to, but you're warned that you're eventually going to have a situation of a hated wife because the lust that kickstarted that relationship is going to go away, and then all you'll be left with is the hated wife. And finally, we read about a man who has a wayward and rebellious son, who doesn't listen to his parents, and eventually that child is executed. Now, the parameters of executing a wayward and rebellious son is vast. So, for example, the Talmud tells us that he has to be between the age of 13 and 13 and 3 months, which is a very small, narrow window of time where he could be included in this category. He has to steal money from his parents. He has to buy meat and wine and eat it and drink it in bad company. And the parents have to willfully choose to prosecute him, meaning if the parents decide to ignore his infractions, he's off the hook. They choose to bring him to court. Initially, he is caned. They give him lashes. If it happens a second time, and again, the parents choose to prosecute him, then he is executed. And Rashi again explains that this is all part of this continuity. You marry this woman, this captive woman, you'll eventually hate her, and you know what? The children that will result from this union will be wayward and rebellious. Now, why, if a child, you know, is a misbehaving child, he's stealing money, he's buying meat and wine, eating it in bad company, but why would that worry that they get executed? So Rashi tells us, quoting from the Talmud in the book of Sanhedrin, he is killed in anticipation of his future behavior. Why? The Torah calculated the continuation of the events. In the end, he's going to exhaust his father's money. And because he developed an addiction for this good wine, for this good meat, he's going to have to seek his fix. He won't be able to steal money from his dad. His dad doesn't have any more money. He's going to go to the crossroads. And he is going to steal from people. Eventually, he's going to commit sins that carry with it the weight of capital punishment, and he's going to die guilty because eventually he's going to be brought to court and tried and executed, and therefore it's better to kill him now. It's better to execute him when he is still innocent than to execute him when he is guilty. 
Now, the Talmud tells us that actually the episode of the Ben Soro More, the wayward and rebellious son, actually never happened. There was never a situation in history, and there never will be a situation in history, where a son at that particular time in his life, 13 to 13 and 3 months, steals from his parents and buys the meat and eats it in bad company, and his parents decide to bring him to court, and there are many other conditions that need to be met for this child to actually get executed. It never happened. And it never will happen. However, why is it written in the Torah? If it never happened, never will happen, it's not practical for any reason. What is the point of it being taught to us? Says the Talmud, study it and gain reward. Which some understand to mean that if you study it, anytime you study Torah, anytime you study Torah, it's, it's good for you, you gain reward. But many of the commentaries tell us that it's not just the idea of studying it and getting reward for the Torah study, but because this story itself carries with it many valuable lessons. And if, if you study it, you'll gain the reward of the lessons. And of course, there's many different lessons that we could maybe deduce from this mitzvah. Uh, maybe one we could say is that parents have to recognize that their children are here for a mission. And the idea that the Talmud says, it's better for a child to die young but righteous than to die old as a sinner, it's something that most parents actually won't feel very comfortable with With that. You know, if a, if a prophet comes and says, oh, your son, when they're 50, they're going to be a terrible person. Let me just kill him right now. No parent would sign off on that. And I'm not saying that we should. But there's an idea, a perspective that you have to realize as a parent that your job it's, is to guide the child in the proper way and to think about the future behavior, not just today, you know, how they're behaving today, but to try to extrapolate over the course of their life to try to see the big picture and try to present the child, put them on the path for success, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Now, the Ibn Ezra, he says, you know, this kid, he's lustful, he's desirous, he can't contain himself, he's drinking to excess, he is getting drunk, and yes, while that may seem innocuous, it really is akin to heresy. Why? Because a heretic is someone who does not value this world, our opportunity to exist, to live in this world, as anything but the pursuit of physical hedonistic pleasure. And similarly, this child, he sees no value in this world aside from fulfilling his lust and his desires, and therefore he is someone that does not deserve the great gift of life. The, the lesson of this story, even though it's not necessarily applicable in a literal sense, you never actually have a case of a 13-year-old kid who does all these things and gets executed, but the lesson for us is that we have to realize that our purpose in this world is not just to fulfill our carnal, our physical, our material indulgences, but to think about our soul and what we're living for long term. Verse 22, if a man committed a sin whose judgment is death, he should be put to death and he is hung on the gallows. So, like we spoke about in the past, there are four different methods of execution in a Jewish court of law, and one of them, the most severe method of execution given to the worst sinners, which is stoning, there is a mitzvah here to hang the bodies on the gallows after they are executed. Now, the Talmud tells us that this is not for all the people that are punished with the worst method of execution. It's only the blasphemer and the idolater that get hung. Now, the Talmud tells us that they're hung right before sunset. Why? Because the verse continues, his body shall not remain for the night on the gallows, rather you should surely bury him on that day. The verse tells us that we have to bury him the same day that we execute him. So we execute him, we hang him, and right away we bury them, and therefore they only execute him right before sunset, so that way they can quickly hang him and quickly take him down and bury him before sunset. Now, the Talmud also derives from here that there is a prohibition to delay burial, not just in the case of a convicted felon, but in any case, unless it's for the benefit of the deceased. So, for example, it's quite common today, you have relatives that live out of town to come for the funeral. A proper burial plot needs to be secured. It's common for people to have their bodies flown to Israel to be interred there. If you're delaying the burial for the benefit of the deceased, that's one thing. Otherwise, we have to make sure that we have to bury them as quickly as as possible. In fact, the Talmud describes how the soul is floating above the body and it doesn't begin the process of transitioning to heaven until the body is buried. Now, the verse gives us a rationale, a reason why the person has to be buried right away. 
for a hanging person is a curse to God. And you shall not contaminate your land, which Shem your God gives you as an inheritance. And Rashi tells us a very powerful idea. When you have a human, a Jew, is being hanged, is being exhibited in front of all, it's an embarrassment to God. Because man is created in the image of God. And the Jewish people were God's children. And it's similar to two twin brothers that look identical. One of them became king. One of them took a different career path, became a criminal. What happens? You catch the criminal and you hang him. And people who walk by, they're like, oh my goodness, the king is hanging. Of course, that's a terrible embarrassment to the king, even though it's not him. It's his identical doppelganger. Similarly, over here, Jewish people, a human created in the image of God. When the human's disgrace, when the Jew's disgrace is being presented, it's also a disgrace to God. And therefore, we have to make sure that even though we have to fulfill this mitzvah, hang him, you hang them for a second, and you right away take them down and bury them with dignity. Now, there is a Kabbalistic idea, central Kabbalistic motif about the parallels between man and even man's body and God and, you know, the two hands, the right hand, the left hand, they have all kinds of symbolism, the ten fingers correspond to the ten sphere, the ten emanations, 32 teeth correspond to 32 paths of wisdom, etc., the hairs on the head, the hairs on the beard. That's, of course, the Kabbalistic idea. But the simple idea or the powerful idea for us is that we have to realize we're compared, at least in this Midrash quoted by Rashi, we're compared to being God's twin. And therefore, what we do, how we behave, is, of course, indicative of God. It's reflection of God. And we have to make sure that we behave in the proper way. Chapter 22 begins with the mitzvah of returning a lost object to its rightful owner. You shall not see the ox of your brother or a sheep or goat cast off and hide yourself from them. You should surely return them to your brother. Don't shield your eyes. Don't ignore it. Instead, return the lost object to your brother. What if you don't know who's the owner? If your brother is not near and you do not know him, then what do you do? You gather inside your house. It should remain with you until your brother inquires after it and then you return it to him. If you don't know who the owner is, you harbor it, you host it. And then when you find the rightful owner and they're able to prove that they truly are the rightful owner, then you give it to him. There's an amazing story in the Talmud about one of the sages, uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, him and his wife, they found a bunch of chickens by their door and they fulfilled this mitzvah of trying to find the owner, but they didn't know who the owner was. So they just brought it into their house. And of course, the next day, the chickens produced eggs. And Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa told his wife, don't eat these eggs. And eventually, the eggs hatched and you have more chickens. And there were so many chickens, they sold the chickens, they bought goats. And eventually, they developed a whole flock of goats. And sometime later, a man, the actual owner who lost the chickens, he arrived at that particular location. He's like, well, some time ago, I left my chickens here. So Rabbi Hanina says, well, do you have a, you have a proof? You have some evidence? You have, is there some sort of identifying mark that you could identify to show that you're the correct owner? And he, and he did, and he showed it to him. And he's like, okay, here are your chickens. And he gave him the goats. That's a, obviously a, a superlative uh, fulfillment of this mitzvah where you tend to the to the items that you found of your brethren, you tend it as if they were yours and take really good care of it. And then we read about the mitzvah of supporting one's fellow struggling animal with the owner's help. You should not see the donkey of your brother or his ox falling on the on the road and hide yourself from them. You should surely stand them up with him. So this is the mitzvah that you're supposed to help your friend unload the cargo from his animal or load the cargo on his animal and to help him. And Rashi tells us, pointing out uh, from the word with him, that the owner can't just kick back his feet and say, uh, you know what? It's your mitzvah. You have to help me load. You go load it yourself. No, it's only a mitzvah when you're doing it together with the owner. And then we read about the prohibition against cross-dressing. Male garb shall be on a woman, and a man shall not wear a woman's garment. For anyone who does that is an abomination to Hashem. And Rashi tells us that this is only clothing and even behavior that leads to abomination. So if it becomes common for men to behave in one way, that's it's not no longer a, a feminine thing, it becomes a masculine thing, then it would be okay. I had a friend who asked his rabbi, is he allowed to pluck his eyebrows because he has a unibrow? And uh, the rabbi told him, well, even though this is normally the, or in history, this would be the behavior of women, because it became common for men to do that, it would be kind of grandfathered in, it's not female garb on a man. 
And then we read about the mitzvah of Shiluch HaKan sending away the mother bird before taking the eggs or the chickens. If a bird's nest happens to be before in the road, or in any tree, or on the ground, young birds or eggs, and the mother is roosting of the young birds or on the eggs, don't take the mother with the young. You should surely send away the mother and take the young for yourself, so that it will be good for you and you'll prolong your days. If you happen to chance upon a mother bird resting on her chicks, on her edge, it's a mitzvah to send away the mother bird before taking the eggs or the chicks. And if you do this, the verse tells us you will be rewarded with long life, says Rashi. There's a tremendous lesson from this. You know, this is a mitzvah that's not expensive. It doesn't cost you anything to send away the mother bird before you take, before you claim the eggs or the chicks. It doesn't cost you anything. And yet, it's a, this free mitzvah guarantees you eternal life. How much more reward will be there for a mitzvah that's difficult for you to do and it's costly? Now, there's a very, very long essay here by the Ramban on the subject of why we do mitzvahs. Is it because God wants us to not practice cruelty and therefore you don't take away the baby chicks when the mom's still there because the mom will get sad, the mom will get terrified, the, you know, she'll, she'll suffer and we want to prevent cruelty? Or should we not think about that and say, you know, this is the will of God. We don't try to pursue reasons. We have to obey his will as if they were solely decrees. This is a huge subject in, in Jewish philosophy. He quotes the Rambam in the Guide uh, to the Perplex, and he argues in him. And one thing everyone agrees upon, at least in this very vast subject, is that we do mitzvahs not for God's benefit, it's for our benefit, but it's a huge subject, and there's a very vigorous debate uh, about you know what's our motivation for doing it. Uh, for doing all the mitzvahs. And there's, of course, many very interesting citations. Uh, one of them, for example, the, it quotes a Midrash. The Midrash says, does God really care how you slaughter an animal? Does it really matter to God if you slaughter from the neck or from the throat? Of course not. It's only for us. The sole reason why God gave us mitzvahs is for us to purify ourselves via them. The next mitzvah that we read about is, if you build a new house, you should make a fence for your roof so that you will not place blood in your house if a fallen one falls from it. So you have a roof. Someone who's on the roof could maybe lose their footing and fall off the roof, and therefore you put a fence around it. That way no one will fall and no one will get hurt. So if you have a swimming pool, very common. People put a fence around it. It's dangerous. So any danger, any hazard that is potentially a uh, a danger to, uh, to other people, it's your responsibility if it's on your property, if you're the owner of it, to prevent that by building a fence, by building some sort of protection around the dangerous thing. Now, there's a very interesting and intriguing philosophical question that is raised here by the commentaries, and they ask, wait a minute, doesn't God oversee everything? And don't we say that if if someone is supposed to die, God will get them regardless of what they do? And don't we say that if someone died, God wanted them dead? Well, if so, why do you need a fence? If someone falls off your roof and they die, isn't that the greatest evidence that God wanted them dead and God would have prevented it if they weren't worthy of dying? So what difference does it make for us to make this fence and save someone? We're not saving anyone. If they were going to die, they're going to die anyhow in some other means. And if they did die... Well, then God wanted them dead anyhow. That's the question. Of course, another big philosophical question. So Rashi here quotes a Midrash. Rashi says that, yes, indeed, this person who falls down, he should have fallen down anyhow. He he was, his time had come, he was supposed to die anyhow. But still, there's no reason for him to die at your hand, in your home. And he quotes uh, another uh, motif from the Talmud that merit is rolled to be done by someone who is meritorious, who is righteous. And bad things are supposed to happen via the wicked, via the people who are not righteous. And therefore, yes, this person was going to die anyhow, but still doesn't have to be in your house thanks to your negligence. That's the opinion of Rashi. Now, the Sefer Chinuch is a very famous essay on this mitzvah. And he, again, is trying to balance the tension that we find over here that we say, yes, of course, God is in control. And yes, no one can really get hurt unless God wills it to happen or at least allows it to happen. On the other hand, what we do, our behavior, our conduct, our negligence also matters. And therefore, 
you know, how do we square that circle? Because are we in charge or is God in charge? Does our free will matter or does it not matter at all? And it's all predetermined by God. And his opinion, again, this is a big subject and I don't want to take definitive stances, but the way I read his opinion is that, yes, God is in charge. But the way God decides what happens is generally speaking via the structure of the rules of nature, the rules of physics that the Almighty created. And physics mandates that if someone falls off a roof and hits themselves, they may die. Physics mandates that if proper protections are not taken, dangerous things can happen and people could get injured and people could, could actually die. And therefore, it is the will of God to allow us to have the free will to choose to use our intellect, to use the guidance that we have the Torah to protect ourselves. And you know what? If someone does not put a fence around the roof and someone does fall, maybe the person was supposed to live. But via the choices that were made by the people, that person chose chose to die. And therefore, God says, okay, that's my will. My will now is if someone chooses to be negligent, the rules of nature are my general will. Of course, there's someone like Abraham who's thrown into the fire, who doesn't get touched. Daniel is thrown with the lines. Nothing happens to him. Of course, those are unique outliers. Those people are not subject to nature. But generally speaking, people are subject to nature. And that is the will of God that their free will can determine whether they will live or whether they will die. Of course, a very big subject. But it's interesting discussion here about this mitzvah, about putting a fence around your roof. And then we read about three different kinds of mixing. Number one, not to intermingle plants. Don't throw seeds of wheat and, and barley and vines in one throw. You have to put the wheat in one place and the barley in a different place and separate the two. Then number two is not to harness or to plow with different species of animals. You don't put a donkey and an ox under one yoke. And number three is not to wear a garment woven of wool and linen that is shot in this. However, Verse 12, we read that tzitzis can be made of interwoven wool and linen because there's a juxtaposition here that you cannot have the combined fibers of wool and linen, but you should make the tzitzis, the fringes in the corners of your garments. And the Talmud tells us that tzitzis is the one exception because tzitzis is a mitzvah. The positive mitzvah of tzitzis overrides the negative mitzvah of not to wear shatnas, not to wear a garment woven of woolen linen. And therefore, if you happen to have tzitzis that are made of shatnas, it would be okay. The next mitzvah we read about is a husband who accuses his wife of infidelity between the betrothal and the wedding. He says he betrothed a virgin, and then on the wedding night, he found out that she was not a virgin, and he's accusing her that she committed a adultery, so to speak, between betrothal and the wedding. Now, when we say betrothal, it's not like what we have today, uh, the concept of an engagement, where people commit to marry each other. This is my fiancé. We're going to get married at some point later on. In the Torah, there are different gradients of marriage, one of them called kiddushin, loosely translated as betrothal, and one of them called nisuin, which is, which is actual the wedding, the consummation of that betrothal. Under both of those situations, the woman is considered a married woman, and if there would be any infidelity, that would be considered adultery. So the husband says, well, I betrothed a virgin, and then on the wedding night, it turns out that she was actually not a virgin, and I suspect that there was adultery in between the betrothal and the wedding. And the verse tells us that if he is proven to have fabricated the story, he is lashed, he is fined, and he also loses his rights to demand a divorce. Thenceforth, she holds all the cards. She wants a divorce. He can be compelled to divorce. And if she does not want a divorce, he cannot divorce her. Now, if there are witnesses that she indeed committed adultery after the halach marriage happened, i.e. after the betrothal, then that is a capital offense and she is executed for adultery together with the offending man, the adulterer. He's also guilty of a capital offense and he too is executed. Now, what if there is a married woman who gets raped? In that case, of course, the man committed adultery. He gets executed, but she obviously is not guilty. She is as guilty as the victim of a homicide 
the verse says. Verse 26, But you should do nothing to the girl, for the girl has not committed a capital sin. For like a man who rises up against his fellow and kills him, so is this thing. So the, the verse compares the victim of rape to the victim of a homicide. You can't blame the victim, obviously. Now the Talmud tells us that the comparison between homicide and rape, it teaches us that in both cases, you can actually kill the perpetrator to prevent him from going ahead with his evil intent. So you see someone chasing someone else with a knife. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. You have an obligation to prevent this from happening, even if it means that you yourself have to kill the perpetrator before he concludes or before he's able to actually go ahead with his with his plan. Similarly, you see someone about to rape someone else, you're allowed to stop them, even if it means taking the law into your own hand and extrajudicially killing the perpetrator. Thus, the connection here that the verse creates here between homicide and rape is actually extended, the principles extended to that other case as well. What about a case where a man rapes an unmarried woman? So there's obviously no adultery. So then he is fined. And again, he loses all the cards. She can compel him to marry her and he would not be able to divorce her unless she chooses to sever the marriage. Okay. So chapter 23 begins with the concept of halachic marriage that it doesn't get activated by certain relationships. A man shall not marry the wife of his father, so it's either his mom or his stepmom, and he should not uncover the robe of his father. And Rashi tells us what that means is that this union, a man with his mother, with his stepmother, that's a union that is so prohibited that even if you try to do it, the marriage itself will not activate versus other cases where even though the union is prohibited because of a sin, but still the marriage is activated. Now Rashi adds that unions that produce bastards, i.e. a mamzer, someone's not married into the Jewish people, and this we'll see a little bit later, that is only the product of a union where there was no feasibility of halachic marriage. And verse 2, we read about a eunuch, someone who has crushed testicles or a severed organ, they cannot marry amongst the Jewish people. Rabbein Bechai, he explains that the primary component of marriage is to bear children, and here this will be a marriage for naught. He can't bear children. He is infertile, and therefore he would not be allowed to to get married. Uh, what about a bastard? Again, that's someone who was born from a union that's not valid, or the child of such a bastard. They may not marry a regular Israelite, but they may marry a fellow Bastard, and then we continue with the the other people that are not allowed to marry most Jewish people. A male Ammonite or a male Moabite convert may not marry an Israelite woman, even though these people converted and they became Jewish. But still, they're not allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people. They'll have to intermarry amongst themselves. You have to have this concurrent other community. Now the Talmud tells us this is only for a male Ammonite and Moabite convert. However, a female Ammonite and Moabite convert may marry an Israelite, a Jewish man. Of course, the most famous example of that is Ruth, the forebearer, the matriarch of the Davidic line, King David, and of course, Messiah, and uh, one of the most important families of the Jewish people. She was a Moabite convert because she was a female. She was allowed to marry amongst the Jewish people. Why are these people, the Ammonites and the Moabites, why are they disincluded from entering the congregation of God? Verse 5, because of the fact that they did not greet you with bread and water on the road when you were leaving Egypt, and because he hired against you Bilam, the son of Baor, of Pithor, Ramnarim, to curse you. These nations are nations that have exhibited character and characteristics and traits that disqualify them from being married, from being united with the Jewish people. And the Rabban adds over here that, of course, Ammon and Moab, those are the two children of Lot. And Lot, of course, is someone that was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah because of Abraham. And Abraham took such great care of Lot. And therefore, that their descendants did not remember the kindness of Abraham, that shows that there's something wrong, something corrupt with their national character. They hired someone to try to destroy the Jewish people. They hired Bilam. They didn't approach you with bread and water like they should have. They weren't gracious. And therefore, because kindness is the hallmark of our nation and the nation of Ammon that does not have this characteristic innately, therefore they're unwelcome and they cannot integrate into our nation. 
However, what about an Egyptian convert or an Edomite convert or convert that descends from Asaph, the brother of Jacob? Verse 8, you should not reject an Edomite for he is your brother. You should not reject an Egyptian for you were a sojourner in his land. Children who are born to them in the third generation may enter the congregation of Hashem. If you have a convert from the nation of Egypt or Edom, they are welcome to intermarry with the Jewish people after three generations. Why are they allowed to join the Jewish people after three generations, whereas the other two nations' converts, the converts from Ammon and Moab, can never join the Jewish people? Rashi tells us a very interesting idea that spiritual violence is deadlier and more harmful than physical violence. Of course, Esau, the, the nation of Edom, the Egyptians, they were physically violent to us. But you know what? The other nations that were spiritually violent to us, it's even worse, and therefore they can never marry amongst the Jewish people. The Ramban adds, and of course this is alluded to by Rashi and in the verse, that we cannot reject these other nations, i.e. the nation of Edom and of Egypt, forever, because after all, we ourselves spend time in Egypt. We were saved with them in the times of the famine where Jacob and his children descended to Egypt. And you know what? They did a tremendous honor to us by taking Joseph, of course, the son of Jacob, and making him a king over them. And therefore, in appreciation for that, we have to reciprocate by allowing them to join, at least after three generations, to join the Jewish people. Similarly, Esau, he is someone who comes from holy seed. He comes from Abram and Isaac. And therefore, there's something special about him. And therefore, they can't be rejected forever. In verse 10, we read, When a camp goes out against your enemies, you should guard against anything evil. What does it mean to guard against anything evil when you're going out to war? Rashi tells us that dangerous times demand extra vigilance. You go out to war, it's dangerous, ostensibly it's physical danger, and therefore you have to be extra vigilant to guard against anything evil. The Ramban adds that this is not necessarily talking about physical danger, it's talking about spiritual danger. War is a grave spiritual danger. In war times, sin is prevalent, people commit all kinds of atrocities and abominations, they steal, they pillage, they even commit promiscuity without any shame, all manners of decadence happen during warfare. And even someone who naturally is very good, is very tender in their heart, in their nature, will be girded with cruelty and with anger when they go out to war. And therefore, the Torah has to give us an extra warning to behave properly and to not accede to the behavior that you see around yourself to guard against all spiritual evil when you go to war. And Ramana adds another point. We, of course, want God on our side all the time, but certainly during warfare. And we better take care to avoid things that will cause him to depart from our camp. Now, the next verse talks about someone who has a seminal emission. If there will be among you a man who is not clean because of a nocturnal occurrence, he shall go out to the camp. He should not enter in the midst of the camp. It's not clear which camp they're talking about. The Ramban, he continues with the previous verse. It's talking about the same military camp. And it's a continuation of the preceding verse. During warfare, you've got to make sure that the people who are impure due to a seminal mission, they're not part of the camp. They don't corrupt the people around them. Rashi says that this, this is talking about the regular camp of the Jewish people. Someone who has this impurity cannot go into the tabernacle sector, cannot go with the Levites who are hanging around the, the, te- the, temp- the temple and the tabernacle area. What is the connection to the preceding verse? So there's a very famous teaching in the Talmud in the book of Avodah Zarah, page 20b. It quotes this verse, you should guard yourself from any bad thing. Don't think by day something that will make you come to impurity by night. And this is the idea of making sure that we don't allow lust to penetrate into our heart, even though it may not immediately manifest itself, but thinking lustful thoughts by day may lead you to actually coming to impurity by night. And importantly, upon this Talmudic teaching, the entire book of Mesilas Yishom, of Path of the Just, is based upon. The Talmud additionally tells us that the verse doesn't say that someone becomes defiled, Rather, it calculates that it adds 16 letters to say that the person is not pure. And there's a lesson for us to try to refrain from any sort of negative words. And then we read about the dignity that we have to have during warfare, even though it's, it's chaos, there's, there's, there's warfare with make sure not to behave 
in a way that is improper to have uh, the proper covering of excrement. You'd go out to dig a hole to go to the bathroom. If you cover it uh, neatly, don't you're not a dog, you're not an animal, even though it's it's warfare. And then we read about the prohibition against returning an escaped slave to his master. If there is an, an escaped slave, either a slave that escapes from their non-Jewish owner comes to us, well, then it's improper for us to send him back to his idolatrous master. Or even if it's a slave that's owned by a Jew, but a Jew outside of the land, it's prohibited for us, once he comes into the land of Israel, it's prohibited for us to send him back outside the land of Israel. And the idea is, Ramban tells us, because when someone is upgrading their holiness, either because they're leaving the idolater and coming to us, they're leaving outside of Israel, coming to Israel, it's improper, even if they're a non-Jewish slave, it's improper for us to place them back in a situation where they will be less holy. Verse 18 tells us that we cannot allow male and female prostitutes to exist. If there's a brothel, the court is tasked with the responsibility of getting it closed. You cannot bring the animal used to exchange for prostitution or for a dog as a sacrifice. So if there's a woman who in exchange for her services, she received an animal. That animal cannot be used in, in, in the temple as a sacrifice. Or if you have someone who trades a dog for the sheep, that sheep cannot be used for a sacrifice. And there's various reasons offered as to why this would be such. Uh, for example, we're told that either it's a disgrace, it's sacrilegious to the things that are holy to offer something that has such a uh, questionable origin as a sacrifice. The Ramban, he says a very deep insight. He says... If a person is allowed to use what they earned from a sin to use that for a mitzvah, it may actually encourage them to further sin. They'll say, you know what? I could behave in this way, and then I'll make up for it by bringing what I earned from it as a sacrifice in the temple. And he adds that dogs were used for hunting, for terrorizing people, even for idolatry, and therefore people would take their dog that they used to terrorize people and upgrade it and say, oh, well, my sin wasn't that bad after all. I turned the dog into a sacrifice via this this sheep that I converted the dog for. Or, of course, the prostitute, she cannot use the the sinful money that she earned to bring a sacrifice. That, says the Ramban, will cause them to do more sin. And then we read about the prohibition against loaning our fellow Jews with interest. This is not only a prohibition on the lender, it's a prohibition on the borrower as well. However, the verse says, you may cause a Gentile to take interest, but you may not cause your brother to take interest. So here we're told that there's a difference between Jews and non-Jews. Jews were not allowed to lend with interest, but non-Jews, we can. And the Rabban explains that lending with interest really makes sense. You know, both parties agree to it. It's an arm's length transaction. And of course, why would I loan money, have my money tied up, swallow the risk without any benefit? It only makes sense to loan money if you're going to get something back, you're going to make some interest. That's true. But for your brother, your Jewish brethren, then you're supposed to love them as yourself and you're not supposed to lend them with interest, even though everyone else, it makes total sense to do it. And it doesn't make even any sense to loan money without interest. But of course, for your brother, you do things that are crazy. And then we read about the prohibition against delaying charitable pledges. And if you don't pledge, it's not a sin. But make sure that you do keep your word. And the Rabban tells us that some fools, they get excited and they pledge to give a tremendous amount of money to charity and they feel great that they had this moment of inspiration, even if it's something they didn't deliver. But you know what? They pledge to do it and that's better than not doing it at all. And of course, the answer is no. It's better for someone to not pledge, to not commit anything, than to commit and to not keep their word. The next mitzvah is that during harvest season, a laborer may eat from what they are collecting, but they cannot take a doggy bag home. Okay, chapter 24 begins with a marriage that goes awry. If a man marries a woman and lives with her, and it will be that she will not find favor in his eyes, for he found in her a matter of immorality, and he wrote for her a bill of divorce, a divorce document presented to her in her hand, and she is sent away from his Homes. This is the idea of marriage. Marriage goes awry, and there may be some infidelity. Rashi tells us that infidelity is a very good reason, very good grounds for divorce. And he sends her with her divorce document. She goes on her merry way. She leaves his house, and she goes to marry another man. And you know what? The latter man is also not happy with her, and he too gives her a bill of divorce. And now she wants to go back to her original husband. 
that is prohibited. Her first husband who divorced her shall not take her back, shall not be his his wife after she had become the father, after she'd been with someone else. It's fourth an abomination before Hashem. The Talmud tells us that this is not just a woman who marries someone else, but also a woman who commits adultery. She has to separate from her first husband. Now, the Ramban, he gives us a very interesting reason for this. This would prevent a loophole of wife swapping. Someone may say, listen, I'll, I'll divorce my wife. She's not married. And she could go do whatever she wants. And the next day, she'll remarry me. And then it was all kosher because there was no marriage on her. She, she was not prohibited as a married woman because she was divorced. In order to prevent that terrible abomination, the Torah tells us that once the woman's been with someone else, she cannot go back to her original husband. And then we read a string of, of mitzvos regarding uh, proper behavior. Now, the first is the idea of the, the honeymoon, the year of honeymoon. For the first year after a man gets married, he cannot go to war. He is responsible to gladden his wife that he took. There is a jaw-dropping Rabbeinu Bahai here. He tells us that the Jewish people and God, the union that we have, it's like a marriage. And where was this wedding? It was at Sinai. And he says that when the verse says that you have to stay home for a year, Naki Hiyele Betoshana, the last letter of each one of these four words spells out the name of God. It's hinting that God actually did this as well. And he adds that after Sinai, how long were the Jewish people at Sinai? They were there for nearly a year. That's the idea. We spend a year after our quote-unquote marriage to God. We spent a year together with him at Sinai. He was fulfilling his duty as so to speak, the the husband of the Jewish people to spend a year with us, isolated with us. And then we read about someone who has a loan to someone else. He cannot take a collateral of something that is a vital need. And the next message we read about is the death penalty for kidnappers. If someone is a kidnapper, they kidnap someone, they sell the hostage or they make them work. That is a capital offense uh, not to tamper with the Torah's affliction without the explicit instruction of the Kohen, the next mitzvah is to remember the episode of Miriam. Of course, Miriam spoke Lashon Hara against her brother Moses, and she was afflicted with Saras for seven days. And it's a mitzvah for us to remember the episode of Miriam and therefore not speak Lashon Hara, not speak evil talk against other people. The Ramban stresses that this is a standalone mitzvah. It's one of the 613 mitzvahs. It's not just good advice to remember what happened to Miriam, but it's actually a mitzvah to verbally say, I remember what happened to Miriam and her punishment. And of course, Miriam is the greatest lesson and the greatest encouragement to not speak Lashon Hara. After all, it was about her brother. It was spoken to a very small group of people. She really loved him. And still, nonetheless, none of that saved her. And in fact, later on in the partial, we'll have another mitzvah of remembrance of something that we're supposed to remember. So again, quickly running through the rest of the mitzvahs here. Don't intrude on your debtor's home to collect the collateral. You have to wait outside. If the debtor is someone who is poor, you cannot keep his collateral overnight. So if you take away his pajamas as collateral that he'll pay back his loan, you have to return to him each night. Don't abuse your employees. Don't delay payment for the services of a day laborer. Relatives are not valid witnesses to give testimony against the relatives. Don't corrupt the judgment of the poor. Don't take the garment of a widow as collateral. And then there's a whole bunch of mitzvahs related to harvesting and what you're supposed to leave for the poor. During harvest, you leave the forgotten sheaves to the poor. You don't shake the olive tree twice. You leave those olives for the poor. You leave the unripe grapes for the poor. And then we read about, in chapter 25, the concept of 40 lashes for many infractions. There's many punishments in the Torah that are monetary fines. Of course, there are some that are capital offenses, but there's many that are offenses that you get lashes for. You get 40 lashes. Why 40? So the Ramban quotes a Midrash that tells us that the Torah was given to the Jewish people over the course of 40 days. And therefore, when someone transgresses Torah, they're transgressing the concept of 40. Moreover, when someone transgresses Torah, it's like they're killing themselves. And how long did it take? For someone to be formed, quotes the Talmud, the Talmud says that it takes around 40 days for for the biological matter to form into the zygote, so to speak, that's going to produce the person. And therefore, because the person sinned with 40, they have to atone for that with 40 lashes. 
And others add that, you know, the sin of the spies, it caused them to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Adam's original sin, there was 10 punishments for Adam, 10 for Eve, 10 for the serpent, and 10 for the land for a total of 40. Now, there's a prohibition against hitting people more than 40. So if someone is guilty and they have to get 40 lashes, we cannot give them 42. And Rashi tells us, this is in verse 3, that this is actually extending to any person. Any person would not allow to hit them. Now, there's a very important Rashi here in verse 4. Rashi points out that with a very meticulous reading of the text, when it starts talking about the person who is a sinner, who is a wicked person who needs to be lashed in the court, it calls him a rasha, a wicked one. But then when it talks about after you hit him, you can't hit him too much because then your brother will be degraded in your eyes. So you have to give him 40, but not 41, not 42. So it says Rashi, the whole day he's called a wicked one, but once he is punished, he is called your brother. And I think that this is maybe a good time to comment on the system that we have in the Western world of criminal punishment. Our system that we have in, in America, I, I think it encourages recidivism. It's all in the name of avoiding cruel and unusual punishment, but isn't it cruel to throw someone in a cage for years surrounded by worse, the worst people in the world? Here's the Torah system. It's just. The person sins, you take him to court, you beat him up, you cane him, you lash him, and you let him go back home. And I think it achieves both aims of criminal punishment. Number one, the deterrence. No one wants to get hit. But it really rehabilitates the person. He was a Russia. He was a wicked person. And then right after he's punished, he is upgraded. He is restored to being your brother. Verse 4, we read about the mitzvah not to muzzle an ox while it is plowing. And then verse 5, we read about Yibum, the concept of Leverite marriage. You have two brothers. One of them dies without any descendants. And then there are two options what to do with his widow. Option number one is Yibum, is marriage, where the brother marries his sister-in-law, and the concept of that is to create a legacy for the deceased brother. And the other option is Chalitza, this kind of divorce ceremony. She removes his shoe and spits in front of him. And obviously, of course, this is a very strange ceremony. There's a very long essay by Urbana B'chai to explain on a Kabbalistic level what exactly is going on when he she is demonstrating that he's rejecting him. He's not building a legacy for his deceased brother. And this Chalitza ceremony happens and then she can marry whomever she wants. Verse 11, we read about a woman who was intervening in a fight between her husband and some other man, and she grabs the genitalia of the man. She has to pay for his shame. Now, the Talmud uses this verse to show that one must opt to save the victim from the attack in a way that does not kill the perpetrator if possible. Like we mentioned earlier, if you see someone trying to go kill someone or rape someone, you have to stop the attack in order to save the victim. Well, what if you have two ways to stop it? You could shoot them and kill them, or you could aim for their knees, and that alone will stop the attack. And it's mandatory for us to do whatever it is, the minimum that we need, and not to kill them unnecessarily. And then we read about having fair and honest measurements. Verse 13, you should not have in your pouch a weight and a weight, a large one and a small one. If I'm selling bananas, I'm selling things, and you know there's a weight that's that's the one pound weight, and I put it on the scale, and it, I give someone a pound of fruits or vegetables, and they pay for the pound that they bought. But I can have two different kinds of weights. I could shave off a little bit of the weight and actually give them a little bit less than a full pound than what they paid for, and that would be prohibited. You should not have in your house a measure and a measure, a large one and a small one, a perfect and honest weight shall you have, and a perfect and honest measure shall you have, so that your days will, shall be lengthened on the land that Hashem your God gives you. For an abomination of Hashem your God are all who do this, all who act corruptly. The parsha ends with the mitzvah of remembering the treachery of Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you were leaving Egypt, that he happened upon you on the way, and he struck those who were hindmost. Rashi tells us that Amalek attacked the people who were sinners and thus were expelled, who were spit out of the protective cloud, all the weaklings at your rear when you were faint and you were exhausted and he did not fear God, it shall be 
that when Hashem your God gives you rest from your enemies all around, in the land that Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall wipe out the memory of Amalek from under the heaven, you shall not forget. So this is the second time in the Parsha that we read about the mitzvah to remember something, remember the treachery of Amalek. What is the connection between remembering what Amalek did to the previous section of measurements uh, that are dishonest? Rashi tells us that dishonesty in measures leads to the provocation of the enemy. If we are dishonest in the weights and the measurements, we're going to inspire someone like Amole to come attack us. Now, what's the connection? What is the possible connection between being dishonest with the weights and the measures and having someone like Amole come and attack us? So I think maybe the connection is that someone who tampers with the weights, they're demonstrating a lack of faith in God. They think that you could alter how much God wants you to have. You could override the will of God by manipulating the measures. God says you're supposed to get a certain amount of income this year, but I'm going to cheat. I'm going to steal. I'm going to be dishonest, and I'll make more than what God has intended for me. And of course, that demonstrates a lack of faith. When someone embraces a lack of faith, the enemy that personifies this form of heresy is awakened. The essence of Amalek is the concept of lack of faith. So, for example, Rashi says, what does it mean that Amalek happened upon you? He gives us three different explanations as to what that means. The word asher karcha, the word karcha, what does it mean? The first opinion, Rashi says, it's rooted in the word mikre, which means a doubt, uncertainty, opacity, happenstance, coincident. That's the essence of Amalek. The idea of, is it really true? Does God really exist? Is the Torah true? Does your prayer matter? Is he even listening? All those questions, all that uncertainty, all that opacity, that's the essence of Amalek. And that, again, would fit in very nicely with the idea of the lack of faith exhibited by someone who is dishonest with their weights. A second opinion is that the word karcha is rooted in the word carry, which means impurity. And the third interpretation of Rashi is that the word karcha is etymologically similar to the word kor, which means cold, that they cooled off after the Jewish people left Egypt. Why? Jewish people left Egypt. The whole world heard about this miraculous exodus, and no one wanted to start up with them. And then you have Amalek that says, okay, I'm ready to start up with the Jewish people. And Rashi gives us an example of someone who had a piping hot bath. And it was so hot, no one was willing to enter it. But one person came and jumped right into it. And even though he was scolded, he still cooled off the bath so that other people could come and join in. Now, there's an obvious question over here on this last idea in Rashi. You know, what were the results of the encounter of the Jewish people with Amalek after the Exodus? The results were a total Jewish victory. Moses, of course, was at the top of the mountain, hands in the air, Aaron on one side, Hur on the other side, and the Jewish people, led by Joshua, decimated Amalek. So why would it encourage imitators? Rashi's whole point is that no one wanted to mess with the Jewish people comes along Amalek, and they say, we'll start up. And everyone's like, oh, if they're willing to do it, then we'll we'll do it as well. But don't they look at the results? And maybe the answer is that when the Jewish people left Egypt, the plan was to go right into the land of Israel, to usher in the Messiah. Moses was supposed to be the Messiah. And they split the sea. And our sages tell us that all the water all over the world also split. There was this revolution that was about to happen. Abraham's vision, Abraham's legacy of monotheism was going to be spread out throughout the world. And what happens? Amalek says, you know what? We know what's going to happen. We know exactly the results of our war with the Jewish people. And you know what? We're going to do it nonetheless. A world where the Abrahamic vision, where God's control is evident. That kind of world, says Amalek, we don't want to live in. And therefore, we're willing to commit suicide, so to speak, and go attack the Jewish people. And yes, what they did is they introduced this 
alternative vision for the world at a time where people all over the world were ripe to hear about what Abraham professed, right to hear about the Jewish version of things, comes on Amalek and says, I'm willing to die to foster the opposing narrative. And indeed, once people saw that, the message cooled. The the bathtub, so to speak, it cooled down and it opened up the door for people to resist and reject what the Jewish people were professing. And of course, our mitzvah is to totally eradicate the name of Amalek. Marty tells us even the animals of Amalek have to go. And we could remember back in the book of Exodus, Rashi tells us that so long as the name of Amalek exists, the name of God is incomplete. Our mission, our national mission that began with Abraham is to disseminate the name of God in the world. And to the degree that the name of Amalek exists, the name of God is not complete. And of course, this extends to us personally. We want to have God have total dominion over our hearts. And there is a little bit of an Amalek within each and, each and every one of us. And to the degree that that exists, God's total dominion over our hearts is not yet complete. Thus concludes Parshas Hisetse, 110 verses, 74 mitzvos. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for downloading. RabbiWolby at gmail.com is my email address. I look forward to speaking to you next week.